quadrupled the rate of obesity in teenagers and young adults over the last 20 years. And that is thought to be in part, in large part, due not just to the McDonald's effect or, or dietary effects, but in part because of the chronic sleep deprivation that now occurs in that generation. So children uh, under the age of 10 and 10 to 20 on average, was, they would get two hours more of sleep one generation ago than our kids do now. Two hours. That's a huge difference. So they are chronically sleep deprived from on the internet, staying late up all night, checking their Facebook, whatever the cause. And we know that when patients are sleep deprived, adults and children, they crave carbohydrates the next day. Recent study, beautiful study, showed that patients in a randomized controlled trial, if you took young healthy people, deprived them of sleep just four hours a night and versus controls, they had the group that was allowed, they were both allowed to eat whatever they wanted. This group who was sleep deprived ate 300 calories more per day on average. Is that because of more insulin production? It is from insulin production. It is from when you are tired or fatigued, the hormones that can regulate wakefulness, uh, especially leptin and ghrelin, and mm -hmm. these are the same hormones that regulate appetite. Mm -hmm. You use glucose as your fuel. That's how you burn. You burn all your tissues burn glucose. So when you're tired or fatigued, your body and your brain sends out a signal to mobilize and create more glucose and take in more glucose. So you crave carbohydrates, you crave comfort food, mac and cheese, mashed potatoes. These are the things you want when you're tired and miserable. And those are the things that give you a quick fix or quick energy. But of course, they raise insulin levels, they raise blood sugar levels, and then they fade very quickly because they have a very high glycemic index. And then two hours later, four hours later, you're hungry again. And so you keep overeating. You keep nibbling all day, chasing the carbs, trying to stay alert. And we use nicotine and caffeine the same way. We don't see the weight gain from those as we do from the carbs. But what do these kids do? That's where the rock star and all these energy drinks come in. So they're using caffeine combined with carbs to get the double kick so that they can get by on six hours of sleep or seven hours when their body needs nine at the age of 15. So that leads to all this increased caloric intake, usually liquid calories, and 300 to 1,000 extra calories a day just from their soft drinks. Then starts the weight gain, and then you start this whole cycle by the time they're 18 to 20 years old. They already have prediabetes, or they may be type 2 diabetic. And they've already gained enough weight that they've developed some degree of sleep apnea on top of that. So we are, I mean, I'm trying to get pediatricians to look at this in 6-year-olds and 8-year-olds, not waiting until they get to be adults, and we have to try to reverse this whole process. What's the solution <coughs> for the shift worker, for the fireman, for the <coughs> police officer, uh, for the intern? Um, somebody that stays up right. long hours or, or works nights? Well, I think there's a lot of approaches that, that need to be uh, taken. One is, is, as you see with the residency programs, I just met with the residency director for the family practice program here this morning, and they have curtailed a lot of their hours. They have, you know, if they stay up all night and they have a busy night on call, they're allowed to go home the next morning instead of having to stay for another 12 hours. Because we know that, A, they're not teachable at that point. They make medical mistakes, and, you know, there's no point in keeping them there. So changing job requirements and training requirements has been part of that. Educating those students or residents or firemen the risk they have when they drive home the next day so that they don't fall asleep behind the wheel. They're educating them that their metabolism is going to be abnormal and they need to avoid the carbohydrates and that they need to recuperate on their days off. Adjusting schedules for a human resource company, you know, for the company, to not put people in rotating shifts. Instead, keep them on a constant shift for a month, and then change and do another month. So for instance, the mines in Elko are some of the worst offenders I've ever seen, and they should know because it actually makes them lose money. Uh, IBM and big companies figured this out long ago. They run a 24-hour cycle worldwide, and they know to do rotating shifts that go forward, and they keep people on the same shift as long as possible because they get higher productivity, less sick leave, less fewer injuries. Out there, they do three days on graveyards, three days off, three days on days, and then two days back on swing shift or something ridiculous. So there's absolutely no circadian rhythm taken into account as to how the shift work is scheduled. They at least do, they bust them back and forth to the work site. If they didn't, you would hear about it every night on the news because it's an hour and a half drive. It's a very boring drive in the middle of nowhere and people who are massively sleep deprived and often have severe untreated apnea. So it's, it's education, it's changing shift work schedules, it's for the firemen and policemen, it's looking at their work shifts and schedules and how those can be adjusted. Uh, it's looking at their medication usage. How are they compensating? Uh, a lot of patients will go home and they take Benadryl to help them sleep the night after. Well, Benadryl lasts for 36 hours. So they're sleepy all the next day and they have no idea that that drug is causing a huge hangover effect the next day. <laughs> yeah. And there's a tremendous amount of medications like that that are over the counter that people use inappropriately all the time, including even among physicians. 
they can be used with limited use. But in a sleep disorders patient, they're actually not safe at all, and in fact, are frequently dangerous. So you want short-acting medications that are timed correctly for when they do need to sleep. So I have many patients who work shift work that they're going to use a sleep aid whenever they're on graveyards or they have to work nights. They're going to use a sleep aid like Lunesta or Ambien, a short-acting drug, the morning when they go home and go to sleep. And the key is they need to be educated. You have to go home and go to bed. Don't try to stay up all night and then stay up the next morning and run errands because that's the time of day to do it. I employ sleep techs. My sleep technologists have to stay up all night. Mm -hmm. They work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. doing sleep studies. You send them home to go to bed. You better believe it. And they wear dark shades on the way home so that they're not exposed to the light. And I want them home as soon as possible. And they know to go home and go to bed and take your Lunesta or Ambien or whatever they may be using and not some long acting drug. And then they sleep on average six hours and they need to be sleeping in a dark, quiet, all the light blocked the phone turned off, the beeper, the cell phone, all the interruptions have to be turned off as if it was 3 o'clock in the morning for you and I, otherwise it, it gets disrupted. And many of those people live what's called a bimodal cycle where they get about six hours of sleep, five hours. They'll wake up, they'll kind of be active for about four or five hours, and then they may take a one-hour nap before going into work that night. And that's okay as long as they know when to do it. Uh, and then many of them will need to use a stimulant drug like Provigil or New Vigil, and these are safer stimulants than the older generation of Adderall and Ritalin that if they're on nights and they have a sleep disorder especially, they should be using. The U.S. military uses it, trust me. All those pilots and those Navy SEALs you saw go in to Iraq in the middle of the night to do, you know, to go into Afghanistan and make that raid, they probably were using provisional. Okay. okay, and many of the pilots do. Uh, it's part of the armamentarium that we use to keep our pilots safe, more alert, uh, in a sleep-deprived situation. So I have them use that at night. And when they go back to a day shift, they can often come off both drugs. They don't have to be on the stimulant or the sedative because they're no longer fighting their own body natural rhythm. And the light from outside sets their clock back to normal. And it's educating them about that. When do you expose yourself to bright light? When do you exercise? When do you eat your meals? When you're rotating shifts? I can tell you with about 95% probability who has sleep apnea and who doesn't from those two factors. The history of the most important things and the reason I, I created this screening tool for primary care doctors is just that. If they have a history of hypertension, atrial fibrillation, uh, cardiovascular disease or stroke, you know, those are big score points, especially if the younger they are, if they have any of those. So those all kind of rack up. If I see those things, especially if I see two or more drugs to control hypertension, very high likelihood they have it right there. So that, those are the most important history factors is what conditions have they been diagnosed with and how much medication has it taken to treat it. Then as far as the, the other part of the history, which is, used to be what was so emphasized, loud snoring, witnessed apnea, waking themselves up, choking or gasping, those are actually the least useful things from the history because only a small percentage of patients have those, 5 to 10%. The bed partner doesn't hear it. They've tuned it out. The patient is asleep. They don't witness it. Rarely do they awaken themselves and remember having an apnea episode. So if you rely on that, you're going to capture just a tiny percentage of the population. And I tell patients, and patients always want to say, oh, I sleep just fine. I don't snore. I say, well, when did you, when you had surgery last month, remember, when you went and got your gallbladder out? Can you tell me what happened while you were under anesthesia? Well, no, I was, in, I was under anesthesia. <laughs> exactly. Your brain has the same brainwave pattern under anesthesia as it does in stage three sleep. So what you can tell me about your sleep is about as useful as what you can tell me about while you're under anesthesia. It's useless, unless it's positive. If they wake up, say, I wake up, my throat's closed, I can't breathe, I wake up choking and gasping. Okay, now it's 100% chance of apnea, but that's a tiny percentage of the patients. So the history is more, do they have fatigue and sleepiness during the day? The bed partner history can be useful if they actually sleep in the same room anymore. Most of them don't. They're sleeping two rooms away because the apnea is so bad. And then are they using medications to get to sleep? So do they, what are they taking to get to sleep? So one-third of apnea patients take a sedative every night, even if it's alcohol. So 70% of Americans use alcohol to get to sleep more than you know, at least several nights a week. Yeah. And a lot of patients with sleep apnea develop insomnia because when they go to sleep, as soon as they start to fall asleep, they have an event, they wake up, and they don't know why. So what do they do? They take their Benadryl, they take two cocktails and a Benadryl, or an Ambien and an Alprazolam, or four or five medications to try and medicate themselves and tranquilize themselves through the insomnia. They still have apnea. In fact, the apnea gets worse on the meds. They still wake up, but they don't remember the awakening now because they have amnesia for the event because of the drug effects especially when they're sleep deprived. So looking at what do they do at bedtime, what meds do they take, do they have insomnia, and then those cardiovascular CNS disease states, that's the biggest part of the history. So when I see a new consult, what I want to see first, give me the med list. I want the med list first, the first thing I look at on the chart. 
I can tell you what disease states they probably have based on that. And if they're on something for uh, impotence, like Viagra, that's another symptom of sleep apnea. If they're on something for depression, another symptom of sleep apnea. And the more of those other comorbidities they've racked up already, and they're only 30 or 40 or 50 years old, then it pretty much guarantees there's a sleep disorder. And because just the odds are sleep apnea is going to be what you find. And they may have restless legs, or they may have other disorders of sleep in primary diagnoses, but those are rare compared to the 98% that have sleep apnea. So you can confirm the diagnosis at home? We can now with how, home sleep studies. How do you do that? Well, basically, after the, the, the history, then the other part of the key piece of the equation is the exam. And, and before we get on to testing is simple exam findings. Body mass index, neck circumference. So get their collar size or put a tape measure around their neck. If it's over 17 inches for a man, even 16, you get marked increased risk. For a woman, anything over 15 inch, marked increase because they've put weight on around their neck or they're short necked. So it's not just your body mass index, where have you gained weight and are you obese or overweight? But is it on your trunk or is it pear shaped? Those make a difference. So a BMI over 30, body mass index over 30, certainly 35, your risk of apnea dramatically increases. Neck size above 16 for a man, 15 for a woman, markedly increased risk. And then the last one is look in the mouth. So I have them open their mouth, stick out their tongue. Don't say ah, just stick out the tongue, use a pen light. What do you see? No tongue blade, just look. And let the palate relax, So because when they first open their mouth and stick their tongue out, their palate will tighten up. And then if you just say hold it, keep your mouth open, then their palate will relax and will come back down. What you can see, that's called a Malampati score, and that was developed by an anesthesiologist many years ago. And if you see nothing but tongue, and the roof of their mouth, that's a four. And it's about a 90% chance of apnea just based on that score alone. If you see everything in the back of the throat, you see the back of the throat, the uvula, the dangly thing, the palate, the tonsils, it all looks wide open, that's a one. And your risk is much less. So for every increase, and there's one, two, three, four, every increase in score, it doubles your chance of apnea. So from a one to two, double it. From two to four, double it again, you know, or two to three, three to four. So if you add up, those three physical exam findings, those history findings, it's a very simple score. Seven items, you've got about a 95 to 98 percent probability of diagnosing apnea with no expensive test, no lab test, just history, physical exam, pretty basic. Once you've got a high score, or at least a moderate suspicion on any screening tool like that, then the patient can be studied either in the sleep lab or at home. Home studies were just created about five years ago. They finally were approved by Medicare about two years ago after studies showed in selected patients with no other comorbidities that they were as accurate as doing it in the lab or reasonably close enough within 85 to 90 percent that we could do home studies and save a lot of money, make it more convenient for the patient. A uh, patient will typically come into a sleep laboratory and it should be done by an accredited sleep center, not by a DME company, not by primary care, not by a chiropractor. It should be done by an accredited sleep center, read by a board certified sleep doc, interpreted and scored by a registered sleep tech, and that's Medicare criteria. So they come in, they pick up the equipment, we show them how to put it on, they go home, they self-apply it that night. It's pretty simple, a band around the chest, a band around the abdomen to measure breathing, a cannula under the nose that measures nasal and oral airflow, a little sensor here, an oximeter to measure oxygen saturations and pulse. That's pretty much it. So, and those are all connected to a small box about the size of an iPod, hooks onto their belt or pajamas while they sleep at night, powered by a nine volt battery. They can manually start it or we can program it to start. They wear it all night, do all their usual routine, take everything off in the morning, and then bring it in the next day. We download the data. What we don't get from that, we don't get sleep time. We're not getting brain waves, so I can't tell EEG or if they're truly asleep or not. So it's not measuring sleep. Uh, we can get body position. We can get an EKG, at least a rhythm strip. Uh, we don't get leg movements, but we can. So it's about six channels of information versus 16 in the lab at one-fifth the cost. The other upside is that patients who are reluctant to come in the lab because of claustrophobia, because of fear, they're much more likely to agree to do a home test. And you eliminate the foreignness of the lab environment, what's called the first night effect. So when you sleep in a hotel room, you don't sleep as well as you do at home, I mean, especially by yourself. It's like, I don't know this bed, I don't know this place, you know, get disoriented after the lights go out. So that, that happens in the sleep lab too, much less when you put all these electrodes on a patient and then ask them to go to sleep. And we know to account for that. So that works for, I would say, 35 to up to 50% of patients who are candidates for a sleep study may meet the criteria for a home study. If they have COPD, if they have heart disease, if they have AFib, any of these other comorbidities, they take narcotics because they're a chronic pain patient, 
those patients will all be studied in the lab, all pediatric cases in the lab, because we, we have to measure sleep in those settings, and we have to measure the effects of the drugs, you know, COPD, is their oxygen low because they're not breathing, is it low because of their lung disease? We can tell that in the lab, I can't tell that at home. So it's a transition, we're the first accredited lab in Nevada to start doing home studies, been doing them for two years, almost three years now, and they had a limited role at first, now it's becoming a bigger and bigger role. The nice part about the home studies is that they can also be used to check on patients after they're on treatment, or say they have surgery, and they have the tonsils and adenoids taken out, and we can do a home study six weeks later and see has it resolved the apnea. Or say they're on CPAP and they're using air pressure, we can check once a year, do a home study, let's make sure that you're getting adequate treatment instead of randomly putting them back in the sleep lab and spending all that time and money. So it's opening up a whole other vista, and it should make the pie for how many people are actually treated instead of 10%, hey, let's try to get to 25% of all the apnea in this country diagnosed. And if it does that, then I'm all for it. A lot of sleep labs and a lot of uh, sleep physicians are very opposed to home testing, and it's taken a lot to push it through. But it's, it's just like resisting any other technology. It's going to happen. Let's make sure it happens in the right way, and the right people are doing it, so, and that we get the right results. We see a lot of police and fire <coughs> annual physicals, mm -hmm. so we don't necessarily see the person but Correct. we see, see the results of their annual physicals, Correct. which gives us blood pressure, height, weight, BMI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It uh, gives us um, all the lipid um, numbers, mm -hmm. and, and we look at that risk. How can we, from, from that annual physical, uh, identify somebody other than, let's say, blood pressure? Mm -hmm. uh, can we identify a person that perhaps has sleep apnea and needs to come in for a visit? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think the reason I, uh, uh, the same question came to me from Ted Burnt, who's a local cardiologist here. He's been in practice for 35 years, one of the most respected cardiologists in, in, in the region. And he came to me years ago and started coming to my journal clubs. And he kept asking me, give me something simple. Give me something simple that I can use to screen my patients. Because I, I would keep coming to me and saying, Ted, 40% of the people walking into your office have sleep apnea, 40%. Study from Mayo Clinic looked at exactly that. They did a random sample of patients walking into the cardiology clinic. They did a sleep study on everybody who walked through the front door of that clinic. 40% had an apnea index of more than 15. About 40% of ours yeah. have uh, insulin resistance. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I said, well, I'll work on that, Ted, because, you know, I know how I screen and capture it, and I had to objectify it. And this simple seven screening tool that I developed, and we're in the process of validating in a large scale, you know, trial looking at all of our patients, I think is this you've already got a PMI. All you need to do is add a next size, look at the comorbidities, and just have some simple rules. If there are more than two, two blood pressure medicines, automatic. That's a big point. If they have any history of cardiac arrhythmia, automatically a big point. And if you have more than three or four of those points, plus a BMI over 30 or even 35 for the fireman because of how muscular their builds are, raise your limit maybe to 35 to allow for that so we don't overscreen. Much less if they developed hypertension at an early age, uh, that should be a big red flag. And then look at a simple exam looking in the mouth. That malampati score, I can show you, picture, you know pictures what? of it, you know just like that. Do, right? So, I mean, even if you're not physically able to examine the patient, mm -hmm. you can look at the numbers and all the numbers you're already collecting. Add one or two more numbers, such as somebody getting a neck circumference or a collar size on that, that individual, and you've got a very good model or way of putting together a predictive model. What, what, are, the, what are the challenges uh, that you face uh, getting somebody to... Uh, adapt to and use a uh, CPAP effectively? Well, I think the first question is what are the challenges we face in getting people diagnosed and treated? And one of the biggest ones is concern that they're going to lose their job. Concern that they can't be a fire, firefighter. They can't be on whatever job they do once they're diagnosed. The concern that they won't be able to get life insurance. Concern they won't be able to keep their health insurance. Concern that, you know, they're going to have to live with the CPAP for the rest of their lives. You know, these are all the impediments for getting patients, especially men and middle-aged men in particular, in to see a doctor about anything much as something that they think perceive as a negative. It's also poor education. Most of them don't know about the cardiovascular consequences. They don't know about all of these connections we just talked about. And that requires that the education be out there that we're not just talking about treating lifestyle and snoring. This isn't about taking your Viagra because it impairs your lifestyle to have erectile dysfunction. You know, you're not going to die of erectile dysfunction. You're going to die of sleep apnea if it's not treated in most cases or complications from it. And when patients understand that, and when I make those connections to all the other meds already taking, all the things they already have or will develop, then it's much easier to get that individual motivated to do anything about it, whether it's CPAP or otherwise. And it's important to understand that, that they have lots of negative perceptions because of other patients who've said things and have had bad experiences in sleep labs that were not done, the studies weren't done correctly, they weren't educated, no follow-up. 
not read by board certified doc, not seen or examined. So there's a lot of bad sleep medicine, quite frankly, that goes on and has gone on for the last 20 years because it's such a young field and so few people were formally trained. We have to get past that. We have standards of care now that everybody should be holding to, and we need to get rid of all of this old baggage and say, this is how we treat now. And we have many options. We have over 40 different mask and nasal devices we can use that are very comfortable, and we will customize the therapy to you if CPAP turns out to be the choice. 80% of the time, CPAP will be the choice. But that means 20% of the time, it's not. And we use a multimodal approach in terms of oral appliance therapy, a bite guard developed by a dentist and fitted by one that pulls the jaw forward so that they can use that for mild snoring or even moderate sleep apnea instead of CPAP, especially if they travel or on the job. And then they use their CPAP at home. So they have dual therapy. Some of them need surgery. And the surgery is not a UPPP. We don't cut out the back of throats anymore. But mostly nasal surgery so that they can breathe through their nose again. Because the biggest problem with getting someone on CPAP by far, saw a case this morning in clinic, is if their nose is obstructed and they're a chronic mouth breather from allergies, deviated septum, whatever it is, you will not make them comfortable by putting a nasal mask on them and blowing cold, dry air up their nose. It's going to make them miserable and they will leak out of their mouth. So the key to getting someone adjusted to CPAP, we've got about 15 different kind of little pearls. One is pre-assessment, assessment of nasal patency, assessment of claustrophobia, anxiety, you know, nighttime GERD. This gentleman has horrible reflux every night. Well, that, of course, wakes him up as much as his apnea, unless we treat that and his hiatal hernia and his eating habits. I can't fix the apnea, and it makes his apnea worse. And then his nose is obstructed, his septum is deviated, he has chronic allergic rhinitis on no treatment. So he needs to be on nasal rinses, nasal steroids, allergy workup if need be. We do allergy testing to figure out what they're allergic to. And then if I need an ENT surgeon to straighten the septum, trim the turbinates, and improve the nasal patency, we'll do that before I put him on CPAP so he doesn't have a negative, miserable experience. So it's a pre-CPAP workup that's so important so that people don't have a bad experience and then say, I'm never trying that again. Because then you've got to overcome that to try to get them compliant. Then once we have those issues addressed, as well as sleep hygiene, shift work, all that, and medications, then we can do home studies, and that lowers the kind of threshold for getting people through. And then just one night in the lab, we have the whole night to try and get them fitted, comfortable with a hands-on tech and respiratory therapist who's well-trained and then adjust the pressure to whatever is needed. Now the technologies, we can do all kinds of adjustments to the machine, even remotely via the web, to adjust the machine and download data from it. So they take the machine, it plugs into the phone line, I can change the pressure, I can change the humidifier setting on my computer without the patient knowing anything's happening. And so we can lower the pressure, we have ramp features, we have what's called C-Flex, where when they exhale, it reduces the pressure so it makes it easier to exhale. So you, you, see, you know who's gonna have more trouble by their predisposed factors coming in, age, lots of things, and how they do the first night on CPAP. So their first night in the lab, how well they do is predictive of how well they do at home. Somebody does well, routine follow-up. See them in two weeks, then four weeks, then three months. Somebody didn't do well, see them a lot more frequently, use Lunesta and other drugs to help them through the insomnia and adjustment. And let them know it takes four to 12 weeks to adjust to it. So, you know, if I tell you when you, know, when you got married, you started wearing a wedding ring. How long did it take you to start fiddling with that ring? Or to not even notice that it's on anymore? Or do I have it on or not? It takes a while for your brain to desensitize to any input like that. The same is true when we have a mask or nasal pillows on the face. So it's very close follow-up, and the first three weeks is critical to make sure they're using it. And now we have cards, smart cards, as well as internet you know, connectivity. I download exactly how much they used it every time they come in. I bring in a little compact flash card, stick it in my tablet, it tells me every night how much they used it, what the pressure is, what the leak is, everything about what's going on at home. So there's no patient tells me one thing, this is what's really happening. I see their shift work disorder. Well, he uses it seven hours a night, except every fifth night he only gets two hours. That's because he's on call or he's working his midnights. And I know that. Okay, well, that correlates with his sleep diary. So we have a lot of tools to get people comfortable and compliant. But the most important is education, follow-up, especially right after they get started, and prepping them the right way for the experience versus it being, and having them involved. So they get a choice. Sometimes we send them home with two masks, and they get to try each one for a week, so they have some sense of control. It's like, I don't like this one as much, I'm gonna try this one for a week instead. And then I can play with these settings on the machine, like the humidifier, gives them some sense of control. And then there's buy-in anytime patients are involved in the therapy versus I'm doing this to you, and then it's a very passive, no, I don't want this kind of thing. So you have to take away that and the victimization kind of passive approach instead.
if you're doing this so you'll feel better and dramatically improve your risk of heart disease, stroke, you might be able to top stop two of your medicines once we get your own CPAP. That's a big carrot to hang out as an incentive to say use this at least. And you tell them some people will use it five hours a night and they'll get almost all the benefits. You don't have to use it eight hours a night and you won't. I have about one in 50 patients uses it eight hours a night every night. But that's the rare exception. That's okay. There's a spectrum of response, spectrum of compliance. As long as we're above four hours, we know we're getting at least about 80% of the benefit of the therapy. So if that's daily average four and a half hours, I'm willing to live with that, knowing that it may be because of the issue of work. And then once they retire or change jobs, we might be able to get that a lot better than we often do. We've been recommending a low carbohydrate diet for those mm -hmm. people that have insulin resistance. Um, can you give us some ideas on what type of diet recommendations you make, especially with somebody craving carbohydrates right. and they right. should, and it's just creating a cycle? Correct. Well, I think it's important, not just a low carbohydrate diet, low carbohydrate diet, but a low glycemic index diet. So they can have their carbs, but they should always be mixed with proteins and appropriate fats so that they don't get the rapid absorption, number one. And more complex carbohydrates and fiber will delay the absorption and delay the insulin response so that they don't get the bottoming out and basically the rebound hunger. And that's true of any weight loss program or weight control program, and especially in these folks. And, and you just have to let them know that that's going to happen. If they eat simple sugar, it's going to give them a quick fix and then a quick letdown. So I, I recommend typically 20 to 30 percent carbohydrate diet, but mostly complex carbs, and never by itself, always with something else. So don't drink orange juice, eat an orange. It's a big difference, and then have something else with it. Have a piece of cheese with it, uh, you know, so that you're getting some carbohydrate, some fat, and you're getting proper absorption of it. So I don't think that's very difficult. The other thing we do is we measure their caloric consumption by getting a resting VO2. So I can get their basal energy metabol you know, metabolic rate very accurately determined, like we used to do in the ICU, to know how to feed someone. We do it as an outpatient, takes 20 minutes, and then I tell them, hey, you burn 1,800 kilocalories a day at rest. So that gives them a benchmark to know when they go see a dietitian and how much they took in on their food diary, how do they adjust for it, exercise or food diary. And it gives them something to objectify a way to lose weight instead of saying, well, I never eat, but I still can't lose weight. Well, not eating actually is not good because then you put your body into this hibernation mode, you downregulate your metabolism, and you make it harder to lose weight. So actually you have to eat to lose weight, and you have to eat properly every two to three hours and the right kinds of foods and know what you're doing to keep that metabolic rate up. So I think the more we give patients objective data, especially if they've been refractory to Weight Watchers and all these other methods, you have to look for those underlying endocrine abnormalities. And I'm surprised very often. I did this first because a lot of my COPD patients are very thin because they work so hard to breathe, then they undereat, and they don't realize they got to burn, they got to take in an extra thousand calories a day just to keep up with their breathing. And so, the, it, the, you know, the formula says they should only need 1,800 kilocalories in this little bitty woman, and I measure it, and they're burning 2,400 just sitting still breathing. So, and it's just the opposite when people who are obese. They overestimate how much they burn uh, per day and how active they are, and they underestimate their portions and their total caloric intake. So you objectify that with food diary and portion control, and then you objectify how much they burn, and then you make them wear a pedometer so that they know how many steps they took per day. Bring me the readings, and that tells me their true activity level. And then take their basal metabolic rate, multiply it times their activity level, and then you know how many calories they burned. So again, it becomes just a simple equation, and, and you can't cheat algebra. It's, it's that simple. And that gives them something to hang on to. And it, it, you know, it catches them. So they're not just in there you know, frustrated, saying, I've done everything and I can't lose weight, can I, can I have some fentiramine? No. I'm not putting you on stimulant drugs to lose weight. So it's a challenge, there's no question, and it's not the only solution to the obesity epidemic, but it's a big part of it. The sleep epidemic has coincided and correlated with it, especially in children. And we think that sleep deprivation is one of the things driving the adult obesity epidemic in the United States. Because what's different about our society than other cultures? We don't see this in Kenya. We don't see this in lots of other developed countries even. And we correlate it, at least some studies have looked at total sleep time and it has not gone down like it has here in the U.S., especially among teenagers and young adults. And that's what's leading to all of it. So, you know, I don't check my emails after, you know, 1030 at night. I don't, you know, I just, I think too much technology is not a good thing, especially for a child who does not know how to regulate it. And they are overwhelmed with it, the whole social media thing, and that I think consumes a huge amount of their time that where is it to get taken from? Because they got all this extra homework and all, it gets taken from their sleep. 
every time. I see it. My niece is graduating high school next this week and going to college. And, and I see the effect on her over these last four years of high school, the pressures, and where does she take it from? More and more she takes it from her sleep and her sleep time. And that's going to eventually catch up with her in college or med school or wherever she decides to go. So complex equation, but there's a lot more, a lot more we could be doing about it, especially in this population. And I've pushed for years, especially with the firemen, that I see these patients that come in, these firemen come in to do their VO2 max, and I'm looking at them from across the room, and I know they have sleep apnea. They have a 20-inch neck. They look miserably sleep-deprived, mm -hmm. huge bags under their eyes from the sleep deprivation. Uh, and, you know, I sometimes just say, hey, open your mouth and look inside. All I can see is tongue, tongue, and nothing else. And then they're already hypertensive, and they're on three meds, and say, okay, why is a 38-year-old or 40-year-old on three blood pressure meds? He's got sleep apnea. And they're at higher risk than the general population, not just by their shift work, but because of their body build. So are wrestlers, so are uh, pro football players. Anybody's used steroids, anabolic steroids, to build up upper body muscle mass. So one of the cardiologists who is on staff with the Denver Broncos did a uh, study, randomly screened all of his you know, graduates, uh, not graduates, but alumni, because they were seeing all these huge rates of death and cardiovascular disease after they retired and went and did sleep studies on everybody as they were retiring from the team. And again, over half had severe sleep apnea. So I mean, that improves right there. And then now they treat all those guys. And there's now, looking at the sports medicine fellowship that I'm involved with with these guys, studies showing that improved sleep equals improved sports performance. Treating sleep apnea or sleep disorders or adequate sleep improves performance. So it, it, it ties to almost every field that uh, I deal with, and new developments and new tie-ins occur every day, every day. This has been so helpful. So. Thank you yeah, thank so you much. Know. That was a spectacular. Yeah.